Morning, everyone. It is a gray, gloomy, cold day outside, but in here we will have warmth and sunshine and care. Welcome to our third service of the summer. Uh, for those of you that haven't come to a summer service before, you'll find it's just a little bit different than our regular services. We still have hymns, we still have announcements, we still have a leader, but it's shorter and our speakers are from the congregation. So far, Judith Karan Shanahan has given one, and Kathy Carter gave one, and now we have Brad Kefoffer giving one. The only time this summer we have someone that's not from the congregation will be in late August, and that is when Michael Brown will come down and be in the, the pulp of that day. So when weather permits, I hope you guys can get out in the Great Grove. It's a wonderful place to go out and hike. The Great Grove was once the home of the Peoria people, and they were good caretakers of the, the land, just as we show our respect and honor them by being good caretakers of the land now. Thank you for joining us in person and online. To help us get to know you, it would be nice to have you wear a name badge. I tend to remember names I've read easier than I remember names I hear. So please wear a name tag. Join us for coffee in the coffee hour down out the hall and down there you'll be able to smell the coffee brewing. And if you would now put your services in, or your electronics into worship mode, that would be a good thing to do. We have assistive devices for you. We have large print hymnals. We have a set free area. There's just about nothing we haven't done to accommodate you. But if we've missed something, let us know and we'll take care of you. Our church welcomes all. Everyone is welcome here regardless of ethnicity, sexual orientation, their creed, their politics, and all kinds of other groups I can't even remember to name. And in late August, believe it or not, we will even welcome our four-legged friends as we have a blessing of the animals. Uh, our church office is going to be closed Monday and Tuesday in observance of the fourth. Our pianist today is Kathy Neal, Mc McNeil. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. Couple other announcements. Um, once again, our church will have a booth at the Peoria Pride Festival, and that's July 15th. There's a, there's a link in the recent block note, or if you wanna sign up the old fashioned way, you can contact Tim. Tim's waves so they know who you are, so they can. If you wanna work at the, the uh, Pride Fest, give Tim a jingle today. 
Um, on Thursday, we're going to gather with other members in our church and we're going to draft our UU elevator speech. You know, some people will say, well, what do you use believe? And it's kind of hard to, get, you know, what would you tell if you just got on the elevator with somebody? Um, my granddaughter and I were in a small town in a museum, and this man was telling us some of the history of the town, and he said, well, you know, it was a Unitarian minister. You know, those Unitarians, they believe in everything and they believe in nothing. <laughs> and my daughter, granddaughter and I just looked at each other and said, yeah, we know. <laughs> um, so that will be Thursday evening. There are several other events and meetings that are being held this week, and please check out the website or the flock notes. Next week's service will be presented by Pat Harris. Pat's here. I know she's here. Her presentation will be, My Father Was an Illegal Alien from Scotland. The service is going to include some special music. We have bagpipes. We have the uh, musician Barry McLeod playing. Um, and Pat is being honored by her five five daughters, as they provide special coffee hour, complete with lunch, cake, special music, stories, and I want all of us to contribute to the roast a la Pat, <laughs> as she grimaces. <laughs> as part of how we welcome each other, we share this moment in our greeting, by greeting our neighbors as we're sitting in our, bleh, just a minute. <laughs> as part of how we welcome each other, we share this moment of greeting with our neighbors during the service. So I invite you to stand up, talk to your neighbor, introduce yourself if you don't know them, and I will bring you all back to uh, your seats by the beginning of the opening hymn, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In.
Jaina, would you come up and read our first reading of the morning? Let There Be Joy in Our Coming Together This Morning by Carl Seberg. Let there be joy in our coming together this morning. Let there be truth heard in the words we speak and the songs we sing. Let there be help and healing for our disharmony and despair. Let there be silence for the voice within us and beyond us. Let there be joy in our coming together. Thank, <clears throat> thank you. Um, our chalice lighting this morning is a flame to light our path. Fire consumes and casts a bright light. May our chalice flame consume our regrets for the past, our fears for the future, and our worries about today. May it light for us a path of joy and peace. And poof, the chalice is lit. <laughs> I don't know where the lighter is. So we will pretend that the chalice is lit. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, can you find something to light things? Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, we all work hard for our financial resources. We use those monetary resources to support our very lives with food and shelter, and hopefully there's a little left over for some joy in our lives. The act of giving of these resources is therefore an act of sacrifice. But resources really aren't given to the church. Instead, we give them to one another because we share with one another. And it's that sharing that keeps our doors open so that we can all participate in our faith. We also share this wealth with local agencies which align with our values. This month, the funds will be going to the neighborhood house. It was established in 1896. It provides a wide variety of community services, including Sunday meals, and a food pantry, adult literacy, and GED classes. They've served over a thousand seniors with uh, Meals on Wheels. So when you put your money in, your plate, in the plate, a portion of that loose offering will go to the neighborhood house. If you want to designate it to go all to the neighborhood house, write that on your check or on the envelope. After the plates are passed, um, and while Kathy is playing music for meditation, we can come up and you're welcome to light a candle. It's a ritual open to all of us to light a flame for celebration, for love and good wishes. It can be a flame for hope, a flame for sorrow or remembrance. Their collective flames acknowledge each week our situations in our life vary, but the shared light provides a stronger light to illuminate our path. Kathy, do you want to start? And can the ushers please come forward?
that we share joys and sorrows that affect the whole community. And during a time when the Supreme Court seems to be canceling the rights of the LGBT plus community, the city of Peoria was shown on a two minute segment on national news, touting Peoria as a safe haven for people who identify as LG LGBTQ, and it's rated within one of the top 14 friendly states um, by the Movement, for, Movement Advancement Project. We'll hold one more moment of quiet for all the joys and sorrows that are in our hearts, but remain unspoken. And now we'll sing the children out as they go back to participate in some child-friendly activities. Our speaker for today is Brad Kiefoffer. He's been a regular sp speaker at our summer services since we first switched over from summer forums where it was just a speaker to a full service as we're doing now. So he's been doing this a number of times. By day, he works with a software analyst for OSF Healthcare. And by night, he writes books, does podcasts about Sherlock's homes, his wife, Kathy Carter, did our service a couple weeks ago, and she's really big on the history of the church, where Brad's favorite subjects tend towards uh, comics. Right? He just told me something reminded him of something, and I have no idea what the reference was. <laughs> uh, in the past services, he's talked about Sherlock Holmes, zombies, Darth Vader, and teddy bears. This time, the topic is professional wrestling, and the agreed-upon lie. Brad? Thanks. This morning, as you just heard, I'm going to talk about professional wrestling. Now, I don't know if you ever thought much about professional wrestling, and I have to wonder if anybody's actually stood up at this pulpit and talked about it before, but I rolled the dice and that was the subject that came up this time. So, professional wrestling. Just in case you're new to the topic, let's define the terms a little bit. If I say the word wrestling, you might think of two very different things. There's amateur wrestling, which is done at high schools, colleges, and in the Olympics. And it's a sport with specific rules, weight classes, gear. I mean, currently Penn State is the top ranked wrestling team in the country. None of those wrestlers are making money for what they do, and none of them, I'm guessing, are over 50 years old. Professional wrestling, however, is a little different thing. It has folks of practically any age getting paid to put on a show. So let's, but let's take that definition a little step further. If you picture a world that has only teenage boys in it, professional wrestling is the ballet, the opera, the theater of that world. It is culture, it is fine art. It, it's a dance performed by very large and very heavy people whose movements are probably limited by their size. And also by small acrobatic folks who can do David versus Goliath battles and often win. It's sports, but it's also entertainment. So now it's called sports entertainment, but we'll get into that a little later. So what makes it so different from more respected fighting sports like boxing or high school wrestling? Well, in professional wrestling, you get to do moves that are more fun for the audience than actually effective. Take, for example, one of the most popular wrestlers of our time, now a full-fledged movie star, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. 
What is the most popular fighting move that Dwayne The Rock Johnson did as he rose in popularity? It's called the people's elbow. Now, let me explain this to you. People's elbow, really, in that little thing, shows you what wrestling is all about. The Rock would fight his opponent, fight, 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 five or 10 minutes, wear him out, somehow get him knocked down so he's laying flat on the mat. He just, oh, he's just beat, he's beat. So then The Rock would stop, was opponent on the mat, and he would look out at the crowd. He would pause for a second. Then he would run at the ropes, and he would bounce off the ropes on one side. Then he would run on the ropes and bounce on the rope the other side. And he would get back to the middle and he would stop and pause just a second. And then he would lift one leg and just fall backwards and drop his right elbow on his opponent's chest. Now, the announcer would call that right in the heart every time. Oh, he got him right in the heart. Now, there wasn't any momentum being built up from him running and bouncing off the ropes or slapping his upper arm on somebody's chest doesn't really knock him out or you know, do anything to keep him laying there. And in fact, the referee could have counted three and got that guy out long before The Rock did his little back and forth and whatever. It really served no practical purpose. But it was kind of fun, and the audience loved it. It's always loved it. It's almost like a little dance The Rock does after he's got the match won for sure. And, you know, other wrestlers have won, I think, Actually, just recently, Snoop Dogg did it in a match just for the heck of it, which tells you something else about wrestling. Not that there was any real question about who would win this match that The Rock was in, because that's the other thing about professional wrestling. The two people in the ring, going into the ring, pretty much know who's going to win the match, which one or, with one or two exceptions, but we'll get back to those. Now, I got into professional wrestling in my 20s because I had a friend who shared his fascination with me. And in those days, in the very early 80s, wrestling shows were held at Richwood's High School Gym. And you could see things like Dick the Bruiser fighting Bobby the Brain Heenan in something called a weasel suit match. Now, if you ever wonder, if you wonder what a weasel suit match is, it's a match where the loser had to put on a weasel suit. It was like footy pajamas with a head on it and stuff. And people wanted to see Bobby the Brain Heenan put on a weasel because they called him a weasel because he was such a bad guy and he cheated all the time. So people really wanted to see him wear that weasel suit. And you know, at the end of the match, he lost and Dick the Bruiser put him in that weasel suit. He didn't want to go in that weasel suit, but he went into it just so we could all start chanting, weasel, weasel. And we were all happy, happy little crowd just because you got to see somebody put on a weasel suit. It's pretty silly, really. I mean, it is. But the thing that was fascinating to me at the time was, back then in the 80s, there were people in that audience that thought what was going on was real. The bad wrestler would cheat. They'd go, hey, referee, that guy cheated. And the referee would go, you hush up. And while the wrestler had his back turned and was telling him you know, to hush up, the guy would cheat some more. And the fans would get even madder. It's like, you know, and it was just this back and forth getting the emotions worked up in the crowd. And then at the end, when the good guy finally beat the cheating wrestler, everybody was all that much more happy because they got all angry and everything, but then, you know, the right side win. I mean, it was a great show and it would work the audience up into such an emotional state that sometimes the police would have to drag somebody off a wrestler because somebody would get a little enthused and attack one of them. Although, I think that part was real with wrestling you just never quite knew. But if you really paid attention, you got to understand some things. Now, one night back in those Richwoods days, I gathered up a group of friends and family, and about eight of us, we went out to wrestling. It was everybody's first time except me. And um, there was a battle royal at the end where all the wrestlers from the whole night would come and have a big fight. And somebody got this great idea. They said, we should bet on this. And I'm like, okay, let's do that. You know, I'm not a con man or a swindler in real life, but, and my family and friends are not stupid people, but this was their first time at a live wrestling show. I think they were still somewhat under the impression it was kind of a sporting event and not just a performance, but, you know, in real sports, you never know what's gonna happen. Bet on horse races because they're unpredictable. We don't, you know, a horse might be favored, but you don't know it's gonna win. And 
truth can be stranger than fiction. So if you watch sports long enough, you'll see some amazing things happen, but you got to watch a few games or a few, you know, whatever, just get those surprises. And to me, that's always been the problem with sports because you have to sit through so many regular games to get to a good standout. Personally, I prefer sports movies because you go to sports movies, they're like real sports, but the right team is going to win at the right time in just the right way because it's a story being told. So while my family and friends had some notion they were watching a sporting competition in that gym, I had figured out I was watching a story being told. Almost all the matches that night ended in the most crowd-pleasing way, except for one. In that match, a popular good guy had not only lost to this cheating badly, it was just an unfair ending, it was horrible. But the end of the night was this battle royal where he would face that guy again and every other bad guy and every other wrestler in the ring. And I thought, well, you know, he lost that one. If he wins the big one at the end, just like in a movie he would, everybody's going to go home happy. So when it happened and the climactic fight happened, that guy won and I won some money. Even though he wasn't the biggest wrestler, the strongest wrestler, or going to win for any other reason, he was the sure thing to me because I knew I was watching a story and there was one way that story was going to happen. And this is all because of something in wrestling. It's a concept they call kayfabe. Kayfabe is thought to have come from carnival wrestling that started to become popular right after the Civil War. Like most other carnival games, carnival wrestling was basically rigged matches set up to get as much money out of the crowd as they possibly could. As professional wrestling started to grow in popularity, moved away from carnivals, they started touring with their own shows in the early 1900s, having matches that followed scripts that helped promoters make sure that the more attractive, more charismatic wrestlers became their champions because people would come back and see the stars. They want, you know, you don't want to see somebody that's just, you don't like at all, just come win every time. No, you want to see the, you know, basically it's like movie stars. It's like wrestling had, had its stars and it always has. But at those times, pro wrestling never made the sports pages of the newspapers because reporters knew it was a stage show, pretending to be a real sport. So there were people, you know, people understood that even then. People that would come to the, you know, county fairs and whatever to see it were, you know, usually going along with it, thinking it was real, but people still kind of knew. And unlike a touring play where actors play their parts while on stage, Wrestlers tried very hard not to let the public see that they were anyone other than the person they saw in the wrestling ring. You know, if, two, if you go see a play, you go out to dinner that night, you see the two actors, you know, that were in the play in a restaurant, you're not thinking they're the same people they were in that play. But with wrestling and this idea of kayfabe, probably because it had originally started in carnivals where, you know, you were tricking people out of their money, people stayed in character. So if... You know, they traveled from town to town. These, you know, think of it like if you had a coworker you went from town to town with and you, you know, worked with every day, but you couldn't go out to dinner with them at night because somebody might see you and go, wait a minute, these guys get along fine. They're, you know, not fighting. So they wanted to keep that illusion alive. Sometimes even, you know, wrestlers would be best friends in real life be the best man at each other's wedding and just keep that wedding private and everything so that nobody ever got to see that they didn't just hate each other horribly and, you know, keep that fighting thing going. Now, pro wrestling could never quite leave that con man side of its carny roots for fear of losing business for a very long time until business started booming. In the 1980s, a promoter named Vince McMahon took advantage of cable TV networks and started pushing his little East Coast wrestling promotion out into the country. And before that was only, there was like regions, like you had a Southern region, you had a Midwest region, you had, you know, the ones I saw at Richwood High School was like just our, our regional wrestlers. But once Vince McMahon and TV kind of took over, it kind of spread out and the World Wrestling Federation expanded, became very popular. So suddenly, 
instead of the little high school thing, you had Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant appearing at the Civic Center in Peoria. So as that grew, spread over the country, and it was on TV all the time, it was kind of hard to maintain that illusion that it was a real sport. Now, the thing about wrestling, it was never all illusion. I mean, if you saw Hulk Hogan struggling to pick up Andre the Giant for a body slam, you knew the guy had to have worked out a little bit. Andre the Giant weighed over 500 pounds, and it took a strong man to pick that guy up. There's high-flying wrestlers that dive off the top rope, do acrobatic, you know, luchadors doing acrobatic flips. Luchadors are the Mexican wrestlers. They wear masks a lot, if you ever saw those. And, you know, like everything else, if their coworkers don't work with them right, something, you know, goes wrong, they can take some actual damage. I mean, it's a very physical profession, just like dance, like sport, anything else. It's so, if, you know, people just saying, oh, it's fake, not really true. Saying it's theatrical, however, definitely true. So, you know, as the 80s went on, things got more popular. The term sports entertainment started to be used more and more, especially after the World Wildlife Federation made the WWF change its initials to WWE for World Wrestling Entertainment. Now, it was one thing to pretend professional wrestling was a true athletic competition when it was just in the high school gyms, but you know, TV, everybody was watching it. It was a little harder to pull it off. And plus, you're on TV, you gotta put on a little better show. And like any other show, Charisma in entertainers won out over skill. Stone Cold Steve Austin, Dwayne The Rock Johnson didn't get to where they were because they were more skilled wrestlers than some of the jobbers that had to lose when they fought them. These guys, they knew how to charm an audience. Now, so you'd see the guy with the world championship belt and you go, now, is he really the best wrestler in the world? Well, wrestling is so tricky. That's the thing, because most of the time we would say, well, no, the guy with the belt isn't probably, he's the guy the upper management likes best, or he's the guy gonna sell the most tickets. But there was a 13 time world championship wrestler who at one time was actually the best wrestler in the world, for real. Because at the 1996 Summer Olympics, a young American named Kurt Angle won the gold medal for freestyle wrestling, despite competing with a broken neck. That's quite a story. He got to be on Wheaties boxes, all that stuff. He was legitimately the best wrestler in the world. And what did he do next? Well, it wasn't professional wrestling right away. They tried to sign him up immediately, but he said when he found out he'd have to lose some matches, he was like, no, I'm not gonna lose matches. I'm the best wrestler in the world. <laughs> so he tried sports announcing. You know, three years later though, he was in the WWF doing professional wrestling. Went from being a world champion amateur wrestler to professional wrestler. And eventually, Kurt Angle was doing things like shooting a larger opponent, a guy named The Big Show, with a tranquilizer dart so he could win the match. So he went from, you know, serious actual competition to craziness like that. And, I mean, that's just the kind of stuff that happens in professional wrestling. And once professional wrestling came out of the closet as more of a show than a sport, a funny thing kind of happened. I mean, you might think, oh, it's been exposed. The fights aren't fair. The exhibition, you know, best wrestler isn't always winning. But no, wrestling just became more popular. Their new fans came in the door knowing it was all a show. The show was good enough that, you know, it didn't have to be 100% real. People could accept that. Although, and well, there was even a few moments, and I think I mentioned this earlier, where it became very obvious that it wasn't 100% real for the fans people knew because there was one very infamous moment, November 9th, 1997, wrestling history, where a match happened called the Montreal Screwjob. Happened in Montreal. Favorite Canadian wrestler Bret Hart was holding the title belt and he'd been in the WWF for 14 years. People loved him, especially in Canada where they were wrestling that night. He had signed a contract with a different wrestling company and it was to be his last match in his home country. And the match planned to end a disqualification so he could go out on top. You know, if he was fighting somebody, they didn't want him to totally win, but they, you know, disqualification good enough. But 
the owner of the WWF, Vince McMahon, orchestrated things with his opponent, Shawn Michaels, and a referee so that once Bret Hart was in this submission mode, they would just go, oh, he tapped out. Can you bring the things over? He won. Shawn Michaels won the belt. And it became obvious the minute it happened that that wasn't what was planned. Bret Hart was so angry, he started destroying the announcer's table and he spit in Vince McMahon's face and things got very, very real all of a sudden. And Canadian wrestling fans hated the WWF for a long time after that because they not only knew for certain that fight was fixed, they knew it was fixed against their guy and not, you know, the way it was supposed to go. But even that scandal in the world of wrestling didn't destroy professional wrestling. It led them to do other stories. They went, oh, nobody likes Fitz McMahon now because he cheated? Let's just make him the worst boss of all time. And so they started telling stories where he was, you know, this horrible boss. And then Stone Cold Steve Austin came up and became very popular because he was the guy that would go against the boss that nobody liked. And, you know, being wrestling, can you name any other sport where a star player like Stone Cold Steve Austin gets to knock out his boss with his big move, the Stone Cold Stunner, knock out the boss's two adult children and the boss's wife all in the same match? <laughs> it's good fun to watch, but it's something that, you know, it's not something you would, and then, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin still had a job after that. That's the thing too, you know, it's like, yeah, somebody might be able to get away with doing that for the moment, but you know, you wouldn't keep your job. So if you can watch this happening, something like that, and not realize professional wrestling is more show than sport, then you're probably very, very, very young. Because at this point, almost all wrestling fans know it's more show than sport, and they're just fine with it. It's fun to play the game. It's fun to watch the rocks people's elbow and pretend it's a powerful, destructive move. It's fun to watch all the bluff, bluff, bluster, betrayal that fills the stories surrounding the matches. And it's fun to believe things like, oh, there's a wrestler named Orange Cassidy, who I just love now, coming up now. Because his thing is, he doesn't care. He fights like this. He has his hands in his pockets and he's jumping and flipping and kicking with his hands in his pockets. And it's like, that would be effective in fighting somebody? But in professional wrestling, it is. I'll watch him all day long. He's a great wrestler. Suspension of disbelief is something we talk about sometimes when we're watching movies. You know, a good movie can talk you into going along with anything if it's a good movie. You know, you're watching a lie and it's okay because you paid for a ticket and you went into a theater knowing that's what you were getting. Now, we don't stand outside movie theaters and watch people go in and say, oh, look at those idiots. They're thinking dragons really exist and fly around all the time. <clears throat> but with wrestling, I mean, we still have a little bit of that thing where people look at wrestling fans and go, oh, look at those dummies. They're getting all excited over this fake sport. Now, I know more than a few, personally, I know more than a few wrestling fans that are very smart people. You know, a terrific newspaper editor I know, an IT security analyst that I can always depend on is a big fan. One of the most creative artists I ever met was a wrestling fan. They aren't dummies. They just know the truth and accept the lie laid over it and enjoy professional wrestling for what it is. And sometimes that's where the fun is. Sometimes not, because right now we're living in a world where the truth of things can be very hard to see. We have politicians spotting out obvious lies that we know they themselves don't believe. We have people who think that talking in a louder voice until everyone else is quiet is what makes something true. We even have computer-based artificial intelligence software that will tell you something that sounds very real but does not have any actual facts behind it because the computer program knows how to put words together in a way that looks like a real thing because it knows what you're looking for and what you think will be an acceptable answer. It's become very tricky at this point, figuring out who actually doesn't understand what's going on and who pretends they don't know what's going on to get something else entirely than they really want. 
And professional wrestling, though, if you pay close attention to it, has actually been very good for practicing telling truth from fiction. What makes wrestling great is the stories it tells, just like any other art form. And like a ballet or a duel in Hamlet or Cirque du Soleil, the fanciest of circuses Cirque du Soleil is, but it's, it's just a physical art form too, wrestling is. Sitting in the audience and enjoying this story being presented and taking in the fiction is something you do. But at the same time, you have to realize these performers trained hard. They learn the moves. They learn not to hurt their fellow players. But occasionally people do get hurt. And, you know, that's why professional wrestlers get annoyed when people say it's fake. Because it's, you know, there's a reality to it that they're dealing with. And a reality that their fans have come to understand as well. And I think that's part of what's really changed about professional wrestling over the years is that at this point, the people that are into it the most understand best what's going on and, you know, have sympathy for the wrestlers. They, you know, they know it's, they don't get mad. It's like, oh, well, you know, that's fake. And, you know, get mad because of something didn't, that, was a part of the story that might not have been, you know, what they went along with. Although still, people, you know, it's like anything else. People will get mad at anything. So, um, when in doubt, when there is doubt, the real devoted wrestling fans, and, you know, you can find them out there on podcasts and newsletters all over the internet, they try to find out, they try really hard to find out what goes on. There's a lot of truth seekers out there in the wrestling world because of this back and forth between fiction and reality. And it's kind of trained its enthusiastic fans to kind of develop a keener sense of what kayfabe is or the part of the story and what is what they call shoot, which is the wrestler's word for something unplanned or something real world that happens in the ring. Because like I talked about earlier with the Montreal Screwjob, if you know, something goes wrong in the ring, you got two big beefy guys out there, one of them might actually start fighting the other one. And that doesn't happen often, but occasionally something can happen that, you know, isn't great. Things aren't like they were back in the days of Dick the Bruiser and Bobby the Brain Heenan. And unlike so many things, like, you know, there are a lot of things where we wish something was like it was in the good old days. Things in the professional wrestling world have actually gotten better. The Pro wrestling industry might have the same problems as other industries with corporate overreach, billionaires behaving badly, you know, just like everything else going these days. But when it comes to looking at their world with honest eyes, both the wrestlers and the fans have made a lot of progress in the last 50 years. They've gotten a lot better at telling truth from fiction and knowing when it's fine to accept a lie or two to make things more entertaining. There's much to be learned from that, especially now when so much of the world seems to be going the opposite direction and, you know, not being able to tell truth from fiction quite so much. So I find hope in professional wrestling because if something like professional wrestling, which started out as a carnival scam 150 years ago or whatever that was, if something like that can evolve, well, maybe it's a sign that other parts of our culture can evolve as well. Well, thanks for coming this morning. And now, if... <laughs> now we're going to have our closing hymn, and you can stand if you're willing and able, for I've Got Peace Like a River, number 100.
The chalice is now extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and the hearts and the souls of each of you. Carry that flame with you as you leave this place and share it. Share it with those you know, share it with those you love, and most especially with those you have yet to meet. As we prepare to leave this sacred space, pack away a piece of this church in your heart. Wrap it carefully like a precious gem. Carry it with you through the joys and the sorrows of your days. Let its gentle glow strengthen you, warm you, remind you of all that is good and true until we gather here again in this place of love. So be it. Thank you.